How many head gaskets have you seen blow up, Aaron? Uh, I don't know, like 10, 12. That's, that's a lot. Yeah, it's, it's quite a few. Is there like any brand in particular that blows more often than others? Or No, I mean, it can happen. You can blow a head gasket on a Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki, Mercury, Evernode. Any of them can blow. Mm-hmm. The most that I've worked on, the, the ones that I saw were Suzuki, Mercury, and Yamaha. But that was just because of the shop that I worked at. That's mostly all the outboards we saw. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty expensive job too. Can be. Yeah. It definitely can get pretty expensive based on what model engine you have. Mm -hmm. And if you're not the one doing the work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cause those labor charges, man, that L six, you got to pull the power head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately, that one is probably one of the more expensive ones because of, you know, that design of that engine with Mm -hmm. the um, block and head being bolted together with those long bolts. You got to Hold the power had to do the whole thing. Yep. Yeah, because some I think the motor mounts are in the way or something. It's just mm-hmm. there's no getting around it. We tried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The two bottom bolts that hold the block and the head together, they won't come out. So you got to pull it out. But mm-hmm. but other ones you can you can do them with the power. It's still on on the engine, so it's not as bad. But yeah. um, it can happen to any engine. Mm-hmm. That's the important part. Mm-hmm. No engine safe. No, nope, not from an overheat. See, that got me thinking because uh, our boy Andrew, he commented on that video of us replacing the head gasket on the boss's boat. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I believe it was the four and five cylinders that blew up. And he's asking if it always blows at the four and five cylinder. And that got me thinking, why does a head gasket blow? Well, for there's a, quite a few different reasons why a head gasket can blow. Um either most of the time it's either pre-ignition detonation or an overheat Mm -hmm. and in the outboard world it's most commonly because of either an overheat or corrosion Mm -hmm. yeah i mean personally i've seen four head gaskets go three of them were l6s and um and one was a suzuki it was Mm -hmm. an f-150 um i think they were all because they overheated Probably because of corrosion buildup in the mm-hmm. in the water passages. Oh yeah, yeah. But um, but that got me thinking with the four and five cylinder thing because you know now that I'm looking back on all three of the L sixes I did, it was the four and five cylinder mm-hmm. that blew the head gasket. Yep. And funnily enough, the exhaust is right next to those cylinders. Exactly. So, you know that brings in the heat. Yep. You know what I mean? You've already got an engine getting hot. You got hot exhaust right next to it, and mm-hmm. sh- poof, there it goes. Yep. That heat creates, you know, um, hot spots, mm-hmm. and then those hot spots are what will either disform or, or, I mean, it, it just tears the gasket. I mean, there, I can't think of the exact name, but it's a metal, it's a plated metal gasket. There's like a s- specific word for it, but that gasket. Uh, especially in the outboard world, since you're mm-hmm. running raw water through the engine, mm-hmm. um, if you go in some shallow water, you pick up some grass, some sand, dirt, something like that, it can clog some of the passages of the cooling water. So then you'll have areas of the engine that are getting hot because you're not getting enough cooling water or um, you're not moving enough cooling water through the wherever it may be the block mm-hmm. or whatever part of the engine and that hot spot will will do that it'll 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 get a yeah spot where you can blow the head gasket blow a hole right through it mm-hmm. yeah i mean the first one i ever pulled it was weird because like you know i'd heard of blown head gaskets and what happens but i've never seen one and right. then I was I was so excited when I got to when I got to pull my first. I mean, I'd pulled a bunch of L6 powerheads up until then, so that was the easy part. Yeah. But pulling the, the pretty much the whole engine apart mm-hmm. was was super fun. I loved it. And, yeah. And yeah, this one, the first one, it just was blown right through. Like like I've seen some of them that are like it gets a little discolored, mm-hmm. and it's not like fully gone the gasket material. Right. It's just like you know you can see a clear discoloration where it's like getting past it. It's mm-hmm. blown. Yeah, but this one was bad. It just <laughs> tore the gasket right apart. <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was pretty cool to see, you know. Um, but it was definitely a long day. It was. Oh yeah, it was a lot of labor for whoever's boat that was. I think it was one of the two Kongs boats. Yeah, yeah, they've done well. They run. I mean, I mean, they put a lot of hours on yeah, those things. It's, it's a lot of hours. It's bound to happen. A lot of time. Mm-hmm. Now, 
the like that going back to that corrosion thing i think that's probably the more common one is the most of the ones that i've seen out of the 10 to 12 Mm -hmm. were all based on an overheat pretty pretty much it was all overheat and um corrosion so like kind of an interesting offshoot from this topic of like a long time ago well not that long ago but early early 2000s from like 2001 2002 to like 2004 05 you had that the 3.3 liter Yamaha Mm -hmm. where the exhaust manifold or not the exhaust manifold but the exhaust in the drive shaft housing would corrode away Mm -hmm. so that is very similar to what happens with the power head because the metal based on running all that salt and dirt and everything in there Mm -hmm. that salt and stuff will get stuck in there around the head around that and it'll start to pit away at the metal which then it'll attack that um gasket first that metal gasket right it can eat right right through that and we've seen a lot of those where that corrosion will actually eat all the way up into the power head Mm-hmm. And if you don't catch it quick enough to exchange, you got to change out the whole exhaust system in the drive shaft housing to fix that of those models. Right. Um, funny also, that's actually the same year that they did the Merkaha or the Yamaha Merk, whatever you want to call it. Yep. yep. Where it that 3 3. Yep. You basically had a Yamaha engine that's Mercury. Painted. How many of those were there? Quite a few. I mean, that was quite a few. Short-lived uh, collaboration, but um, definitely quite a few of those engines were made and mm-hmm. put out into the world, but they had that exhaust issue. Hmm. See, that's interesting. I'd seen um, on a 350, an F-350, that mm-hmm. you remember that big, what was it, a 42 Pursuit or something? Was it a 42? Maybe it was. I mean, I, it was like a 39, 42, something yeah, like that. Yeah, I think it was a 38, actually. It was like a weird design pursuit, you mm-hmm. know, big luxury boat with a cabin, and, yep. and it had this weird, like, hood for the outboards. Yep. You know what I mean? It was like, yep. it was definitely interesting, but guy ran into a sandbar, and um, and it just packed a bunch of sand up into the exhaust, mm-hmm. I guess. I think it was all in the exhaust because it got so hot that yep. there's an exhaust tube that runs in between like in the middle of the oil pan. Yep. And um and it just corroded away. Like it disappeared. I mean, I didn't find out until I had the engine trimmed out cuz we we started it up, we ran it. Yep. And it it ran okay. I mean, it was it was fine powerhead wise. Powerhead wise. Yeah, and like it was peeing, like everything was good. You couldn't see what was wrong with it. So, I'm tilting it up to put the, the lower unit back up. And then as I grab the lower unit, I see a drop of oil. Boom. And I'm like, there shouldn't be oil coming out I'm of here. like, this isn't an L6. <laughs> There's no reason oil should come out. Yeah. You know, with the lower unit out. Right. And um, and sure enough, I started looking at the diagram and the parts catalog, and I was like, hmm, there is a gasket there. What if what if it just got so hot that it... Mm-hmm. And I was right. I mean, I pulled the power head. I pulled this whole uh, midsection apart, and, and it was gone. Like, I was looking at my new parts that I ordered because <laughs> I ordered the whole midsection. Part. Right, right. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, where did this tube go? It's not, it's not here. It, the old one was gone. Just, just there was like this weird. It was like aluminum packed with sand. It looked like rock, really, from how hot it had gotten. Yeah, it was packed into the exhaust and lower molded unit. a molten, yeah. molten rock. Mm-hmm. And that thing being, you know, being that it um, disintegrated. Right, the, the bolts were loose there, obviously, and. Uh, the gasket, it, that's where the oil was getting passed uh, mm-hmm. from the oil pan down the exhaust and and out there. And that was a pretty long job, but I'm surprised he didn't blow a head gasket there. I mean, yeah, a lot of times I've seen quite a few of those um, most common ones. I mean, it all depends on the operator. Um, so not bashing on the Yamahas, but yeah. um, I've seen quite a few where they bay boat, and a rental boat. I saw a rental boat. The guy had an F two hundred, and then the other guy, um, one of our favorite people that introduced us to the Buntinis. Oh, <laughs> his, love that guy. his boat. He um, same thing. He he ran into something shallow up in the bay or something, and sucked up all this sand and packed everything out. And I don't know if 
you know, I don't know who was running the boat or what, but they ran it back and it just got so hot that it melted the valve covers, the plastic shrouds that hold the wire harness together. Like, um, same thing, the heads blew the head gaskets. Like on that one, it actually, it got so hot that it blew the head gasket and then hydro locked the engine because it, it allowed so much water into the cylinder that it just locked the engine up. Holy crap. Yep. You know, that's the first time I've heard of that. I really? mean, I, cause I did that repower. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm the one who changed that that old engine. I forgot what he had. What did he, was it? A three three? It was a three three two fifty. An old three three, and I put that uh, that F two hundred, and and I did that whole repower. I had no idea what had happened to that engine. Yep, because I think the engine was already pulled off by the time yeah I got to the repower. Pulled the head, pulled the um, the heads and all that stuff, and the the main issue was that there weren't a, the parts weren't available. Couldn't get a mm. power head. He looked around for a head. Heads were, you know, astronomical at that point in time. This is all the COVID, you know, mm-hmm. time. Yep. And um, when everything was just crazy. Yeah. And it it just had the engine ended up sitting there and just was, it was done. But, yeah, I've seen that quite, I mean, because they got plastic valve covers. So the valve cover, seen them on an L6 too, or it gets hot and it warps the valve cover. And then now the thing's leaking oil, so you got to change the valve covers and all this stuff, mm-hmm. um, all from you know running aground. That's crazy. I wonder how far back he made it. <laughs> Did he make it all the way home? Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Made it all the way back and and just perfect timing. Just, just locked up. Just right right that there was at it. the dock. <laughs> <laughs> just locked up at the dock. I, I think like, it, all right, that was it. I got you home, bud. <laughs> I can't remember if like I think it. He got back, and then. Um, went to go use the boat the next day and it just like was just running like terrible. And then he asked us to look at it. We got on the boat and it, it wouldn't even start. And that's when we, you know, pull everything apart and like, oh my goodness. Like you could see everything melted. Wire harness is all melted. The wow. valve cover, the shrouds is like, oh, dude, this thing got really, really hot. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Did you, would you not see that? Like, is there any sp- steam or smoke or something that would come off that i don't know exactly you think if it's so hot that the valve covers well, are melting usually it goes into an RP, rpm reduction so yeah that's right it would say hey overheating mm-hmm. like can't rpm limits the rpms so it i don't kinda, know it is kind of interesting the guy was totally clueless as to maybe like there's something you know like why would he start it up and run it again <laughs> there's dude <laughs> it's so funny that like sometimes people you know, no one wants to admit anything like, you know, you get a lot of captains, this, that, and the other thing that, you know, when it comes down to it, the story's never like, no yeah. one admits it, you know, like, the, you know, we have a joke that a lot of times people, you know, as soon as the, as soon as the alarms come on, that means, you know, go mode. That's like <laughs> handles down, just go, man. That's like, that's, that's the, uh, ride this thing out till it blows. Yeah. Hopefully I get home. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that a lot of people don't want to admit what happened. Right. So they just give the whole no idea. I don't know what happened. I mean, uh, nothing. I was running. And I was running. And, and I wasn't. And then, well, yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like, that's always the what same happened? story. It's always the same story. It's like, I don't know. I was just running along. And then and the then engine start, stopped working. You start reading the freeze frame. And you're like, overheat four times. Yeah. Like, like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> You didn't hear that? <laughs> yeah. It's all on the dash. The alarms are going off. Like yeah. the engine's back into an RPM reduction. But like, you know, and, and I think a lot of people just get embarrassed that, you know, like, like, look, think, some, of, think of your mechanic, like your doctor. Don't get embarrassed. Yeah. You know, we if, can't diagnose something easily no. unless we know what happened. <laughs> exactly. It, I, I think that a lot of people aren't, When you're not on it all the time, you know, like we were talking about how many hours some people put on their boats and some people don't even put on, you know, a couple hundred hours in a year. So Mm -hmm. they're not used to running the boat. And so they feel like whenever something like that happens to them, that it's like their fault Mm -hmm. when it's like, it's not really your fault because I I can't even, I can't even tell you. Yeah. But I can't even tell you how many times I've ran aground. I mean, multiple times, just sure. Just running shallow, the tide changes. Sometimes I run through here all the time on plane, and I mean, it happens. You What's hit the a low most tide? aggressively you've ever hit ground. 
Have you ever like hit it so hard that you get flung forward or? Um, not, um, probably one of the, one of the more aggressive ones. I was actually had my mom and dad on the boat and we were probably doing like 30 and just, oh, no. I mean, it was a super low tide, you know, one of the, one of the, um, what do they call it? The, um, king tides or whatever. Okay. Low tide on a king tide. And I low was tied on a king tide. I thought king tides were super high. Well, I mean, like there. I don't know. I also don't know anything about the, the tides, really. Whatever moon phase it was <laughs> right. that that brings that ultra low tide, it was one of those. And there's a certain, you know, stretch going to one of these sandbars that that we're gonna go check out that I would take. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, I mean, I cut it close sometimes, you know, because like, yeah. I know when I'm on plane, I can get over here and there, and you know, I'll, I'll take some shortcuts, and not that time, not that time, <laughs> not that time. We just we hit, came off plane, and then oh. you know, I mean, I was able to to get out of there, but yeah, I'm I'm not really most of the places that I hit ground, like I know I can get through there, but on certain times you can't. And, you know, most of them are just like a tap or a kiss. A lot of times I've read, oh, well, that's not true. One time I was like back in the contents. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a hard hit, but like there's a certain area where like these rock come out. And again, a low tide. Most of the time I'll like, I can float into this area. Yeah. And it wasn't, I we, I trying to get in there and started hitting these rocks and had to back out of there. Oh. But, um. It, it happens. And and I think most people feel like it's their fault. Oh, I should have known better. This well, it, it happens. And it happens to all of us. So you shouldn't be embarrassed. But, you know, at the on the other side of the coin, whenever the lights and the alarms and the RPM loader comes on, that doesn't mean put the handle down and go. No. Right? If anything, it's quite the opposite. Yeah. I would. Well, I don't know. I guess I've never had it happen to me out there. But what, what do you do? Do you just turn off and sit there and be like, well... I wonder what it was. I don't have a computer. I can't tell what it was. Mm-mm. I mean, like, whenever you hit the ground, depending on where it is. I mean, when, when alarms start screaming at you, what do you do? Because some of those, like, you know, a, an older Yamaha system that doesn't have any mm-hmm. gauges or anything, like, it'll scream an alarm at you. Mm-hmm. And but it you won't have, tell you anything. You have no idea what it is. You're like, uh, that could be anything. Just Am I, should I be concerned? Just go back to the basics. You know, come off plane, bring it back to idle, go back, see if it's peeing. If it's not peeing, turn the engine off mm-hmm. and then kind of go back and inspect. You know, trim it up out of the water. See if you got a bunch of grass sucked around the water intakes. See if maybe you got a, ba- a plastic bag or something that wrapped around the intakes. Mm-hmm. Um, if you hit ground like a sandbar or something, just. Um, you know, raise the engine up, get it to where the, the intakes are still in the water, and then, you know, turn it on and try and go in reverse and, and back off of the sandbar. Don't try and power through it. Um, and then, you know, if you have to, get everybody out of the boat so that way you can get the weight out of the boat and then try and push it off and back it out, you know. But hmm. some people just get, you know, it's the old adage, panic and throttle. As soon yeah. as something happens, just panic and throttle. And like, yep, yep. that can get real bad where, especially if you hit ground and you panic and throttle yeah. and then you just drive yourself way worse than mm. what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Bringing it back to the cost of that job though, of a head gasket. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause we did have that, that one video where it was, you know, saving the, the power head or whatever, 300 bucks. It well, was it was around three hundred bucks. It dude. was about three hundred bucks, but that's the boat that we used. Exactly, like, that's like, like our boat. Like, like, yeah, you know, maybe it's it's going to be more for everyone else, but oh, that's because yeah. you're going to be paying labor. You yep. know what I mean? If you're doing it yourself, if you're doing it yourself. That's what it looks a like. A head gasket is. I mean, how much is an L six head gasket? Not. It's like, I want to say it's almost like a hundred bucks. I mean, it's not a. It's not like a super cheap gasket. There's a thirty year budget. Some JB weld for that little corroded hole mm-hmm. there was. And Mind you, there was like 2,000 hours on that end? No. More. More. Like Way 20, more. 2,500, almost 3,000 maybe? It close to 3,000 hours. Mm-hmm. And also, I mean, there was two owners at the marina. The second owner was flying in. Mm-hmm. They wanted to use the boat that day. Mm-hmm. So yep. we had to get it. You know, there was no... Oh yeah, no, there wasn't a waiting. Like no, yeah, exactly. It was it was get this thing on the water running, 
and, and we're that, gonna repower it soon anyway. Yeah, and that engine I mean? was nearing the end of its life mm-hmm. too. So there's not but really. He ended up putting another few hundred hours on it though. Yeah, like at least five hundred, at yeah, least five hundred. Yeah. But then they finally repowered. I think they mm-hmm. did it a couple months ago. Like it just yeah just happened. You know that's that's the funny thing is there. I saw a comment one time that you know they said the JB Weld channel, but <laughs> yeah. I mean I'll be honest with you, some of that stuff is pretty impressive because I have everybody's different and everybody's budget's different. Mm-hmm. So you know what some people consider like the ability of doing so. Oh, I'll send the head off, do this, do that, buy a new engine. Well, there's some people that have this boat that that ain't an option for them. They've got, you know, they got the JB Weld budget. So yeah, yeah. like their, their concern <laughs> is trying to get up back out on the water. You know, they're not, you know, into spending two yeah. months and, and a few grand. They're like, dude, I, I just want to go out. You know, if you can get me a couple more seasons out of this thing, let's do that. And I mean, I've seen, I remember one L6, where the block, it was a 300, and the block was, like, beginning to get porous. There was quite a bit of hours on that engine, too. And it was leaking oil through the pores of the top of the um, block of the engine under the flywheel. And I really? I cleaned that thing off, and I just put JB Weld on the top of it for, like, you know, like a layer. And that guy put, like, 1,500 hours on that engine and got, like, four years out of it actually that's not true because he's still running it today (laughs) hold on it got porous yeah well i mean i guess those those all all the mercury powerheads really are made out of like a styrofoam Mm -hmm. cast or whatever right yep yep and they pour the um the metal in there and and do you think that has something to do with why it became porous or corrosion no, I think have to look I, I think it. it was I think it was just in the in the cast. It mm-hmm. was just in the cast and and it just happens. It's Whatever kind of the or the aluminum or yeah, those are aluminum blocks. I think um, so. And and the yeah, just just what it was. I mean, every, you know, it's an engine. It it's manufactured, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I, I on the top of it right where that that spot was, I just coated the whole thing in JB Weld, let it sit for a day and um put that thing back in the water and, and he's still running it today. So that was, that was, a, no, actually it's 2023. That was, I think back in like 2016. Wow. So, and I know he's got at least 1500 hours, if not more. Mm-hmm. He since, runs the boat. Since I did that. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, you I know, mean, for. Weld ain't bad, especially, you know, in certain places. Like obviously if you got a hole in the side of your block. Yeah. No. You're not putting JB Well. Yeah. JB Weld to seal a cylinder. But actually, I don't know because Eddie had Get that had that Yamaha F one fifty on his <laughs> on his bowling netter, and I don't know what it was. There was a year for quite a while where the Yamaha on the side of like the adapter plate, it like for whatever reason there's a hole that corrodes through it, and he took he took like a dime or a penny. And put a pin, you know, like put JB Weld on there, and then put like that dime or that penny or whatever it was in there, and then covered that over with JB Weld, and that's how he's been Stop. running his engine. No, he's still running it. Yeah, Eddie. Yeah. What? Yeah. He sealed that thing with a penny yeah. and JB Weld. Yep. He's a bowling netter. I mean, he goes you know in season he goes out every night. Yeah. So like sometimes he'll be out there for eight hours. Holy crap. <laughs> Dude, the stuff is magic. I don't know what to say. In it's, our defense for that particular video, too, yeah. what, what were we putting JB Weld on? It was the, the water, the thermostat dump, wasn't it? Yep, the thermostat dump housing in the adapter plate. So, I mean, yeah, maybe it's a little hot, but what are you it's, do? Not, it's not so such a bad spot that you can't put some JB Weld there. You know, it'll hold for, for yeah. extending. You, th- you got to think about this the life of this engine. This engine's mm-hmm. lived a long life. Mm-hmm. This is just... Putting a little band aid on them to give them a little. <laughs> yeah. a little well, it's more. either it's either you spend fifteen bucks on that, or you spend what a grand or so on an adapter plate plus all the time of taking the adapter plate off. 
So now you got the ga- gaskets for the drive shaft housing, the oil pump, the, you know, back, you know, you had to buy the base gasket anyway, but all the other parts that go in there. Yeah. So. And I'm sure if, if they weren't on such a crunch to, to have the boat. Yeah. We, they we probably, had, he probably would have been like, Oh, just, you know, go ahead and order the stuff. No, but, he wouldn't have ordered it, but we have some of those laying in like, there were some that we had laying around. Oh, but he just wasn't having it. He was like, I need the boat. Yeah. Get it done. Then we'd have to take it off. Yeah. So you're going to add the time. Which oh, would, you mean like out of an engine that's laying around? Just take apart the midsection? Well, one of those that ones that had the blown up power head yeah. there in the back. Mm-hmm. We could have took one of those. Could have. That's a lot of time, though. It's a lot of time, a lot of work. Yeah. Definitely not a Saturday project. No. And, I mean, you're not, you're not going to gain that much more. I, I mean, I think every, you're trying to... You're trying to take something that's almost on the way out mm-hmm. and try and, you know, stretch another 10 years out of something. Like, it's not yeah, no. it's not one of those cases. Yeah, you got to be realistic, too, about yeah what you're trying to get out of the engine. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, that engine's not worth, you know. So it's, it's been through a lot. It's been through a lot, but someone can put that on their boat and, and run it. No mm-hmm. problem. I yeah. mean, it's... Boating on a budget. Yeah, <laughs> you're boating on a budget. I mean, you're trying to you know you're trying to run a 350 horsepower supercharged engine. Yeah, with you know on 20 bucks. Were those 350s? I think so. Weren't they? I don't remember. Oh, maybe they were 300s. I think they were 300s. I think they were 300s. Yep. And they were the older style Verado. Mm-hmm. L6 came, anyway. Yeah. Came off of a 38 Fountain. Was it? Mm-hmm. That. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's right. It came off of that boat and then took two of them for the venture because he had trips, yep. right? Yeah, and the other one, the other one, actually got put onto um, the powerhead, went from the center engine and got put on a CV, the thirty nine that we're going to go down and do. That's actually going to get V tens put on it. Ooh, that's going to be good. Mm-hmm. V tens. Yep, that one's going from triple. 300s l6 is to triple are they 300s or 275s they might be 300s i thought they were 300s they they might be i thought i thought they were old i think that boat's like a 2007 or 8 or something right they get to 2008 they might i don't know i'm not 100 percent. but either way it's going to be a giant upgrade Mm -hmm. i mean even just you know, even if it was 350s or 400s, it would still be a giant upgrade because oh, yeah. them V10s are going to have the torque to push a big old fatty like that CV. It's like adding a fourth engine. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. adding two times three. I bet I if mean, you were to... What? Yeah, yeah, two times three. Six cylinders. Oh, yeah. You mean in... in oh, no, that's cylinders. V8s. No, this is V10s. So you're actually doing 12 more cylinders. It's almost like adding... Two more engines to the back of the boat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or a 600. No. Yeah, yeah. No, but, um, but yeah, they're going to... I'd love to feel it, because cause you can feel the torque on those, like a 300 RV8. Mm-hmm. You ever... I mean, um, we've put a, a, a bunch of those 300 Rs on boats at this yeah. point. And, like, just in that first mm-hmm. little bump, it's... Just, like it plants you back in the seat. It's kind of oh, yeah. it's kind of ridiculous. I was like, whoa. Yeah, it's that's, pretty impressive. Yeah. So, I mean, torque is underrated in the mm-hmm. in the outboard industry. It's not a number that gets thrown around a lot, but Mm-mm. it's a number that's showing to be pretty important here. Um, mm-hmm. It's the same thing. Like like I'd heard um, I'd heard three fifty Yamahas, those big fat V eights, mm-hmm. were actually they perform better on a heavier boat than trip 400 uh l6s absolutely they do because i mean just, it's more more displacement more 5.3 liter just, over yeah. a 2.6 supercharged yeah yeah it's, i mean it's a bigger piston there's no replacement for displacement it moves weight mm-hmm. as far as moving weight yeah as far as weight but i mean these outboard i mean these boats Even, you know what boats are going to benefit the most from it is is tower boats yeah which this one has a big tower on it right no, he's got just a normal tower. No, oh, okay. He's got a tower, but it's not. You stand on the mm-hmm. t-top, you know, basically. Okay. It's yeah, not yeah. like an actual 
tower. I love his, like the whole setup with it and everything. I know it's oh, yeah. uh, it's kind of counterproductive, I guess, because if you're fishing and you want that open fisherman thing, you don't want to be bringing a rod around a pole or whatever for yeah. the t top. But the the shade is is crucial. But like you said, in the fishing, it's not logistical for fishing because. Um, just in the just in the operation of bringing a fish in the boat with these with these center consoles, that's why they like the center consoles because you can get the guy with the rod, the fisherman, he can go up the gunnel, mm-hmm. you know, keep the boat in forward, so that way you got you know the boat's still moving forward. Which the fish, once you tire it out, he'll like he'll just follow the boat, you know, because it's easier if the boat's going, he just kind of gets in line with the yeah with the um, the stream basically, mm-hmm. and you can have the fisherman walk up the side of the boat so that way the guy with the gaff can go to the back of the boat and then once you get the fish up to the back you can grab it and get it in the boat you don't lose the fish as you know a lot of people try and get the gaff and then the fish guy's in the back and then the fish is going like this and then you're playing the game of trying to stab it and then you lose the fish because you you gaff the line and unset the hook and it becomes a disaster yeah but you know standard operating procedure just have the fisher go up the gunnel gas in the back boom hit it you know the fish is tired so it just stays you know just kind of like follows that along the boat pretty pretty easy to get it in Mm -hmm. with that t-top coming down at the gunnel like that you don't have that ability like you said you got you got the rod in order to get around that you've got to lift the rod out around the t-top come in with the other hand grab it and then you know do that little maneuver yeah and you know you got a big old fish on there yeah it's not practical it's it's not and, I mean, and maybe risky. if you got another person you could you know two hand hand off like yeah but it's a whole you better hang on dude <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you know that's that's why most people don't like it but then the other people you've got all that shade factor so dude that boat that boat in particular is what made me fall in love with cvs really because I mean, I remember the first time it rolled into the marina when it was getting sold or had just mm-hmm. been sold or whatever. It was a blacked out CV and it, it had been kept in like inside in storage. So mm-hmm. paint was, you know, still perfectly Beautiful. fresh and had this big old lettering on the side, the X-Man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, big, this big T-top with the coming down at the gunnels. And I was just like, whoa, <laughs> like, that's a boat, dude. And then yep. we took it out and you... You were like, to watch this, and you could turn that thing on a dime. Oh, dude, CV giant boat, and it just sticks to the water, and yep. just boom, turns right there. And I was like, even when the ones with the towers, I mean, the- like you can, did you can cut a U in a CV? I like was, I was, I mean, looking at the water. Oh yeah, you know oh I mean? yeah, they 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 heal over. Dude, yeah. So you heal you you cut a U in that boat, and it heals over. Like you know, like in sailing, they say you know, getting the get getting, getting the rails wet. Yeah, you can all. You know, I mean, basically the same thing. And they, they're not like. But I've never felt more comfortable looking at the water horizontally <laughs> like that. I mean, I mean, I was just sitting there like, this is amazing. I don't know. I could talk good things about CV all day. They're yeah, they're awesome. But yeah, but most that definitely. boat in particular is just that was the one. Because yeah. I don't know how does that what how does that work on a CVZ. It doesn't have as much stick because that's a CV like B mm-hmm. model. There, you know, it's got the. It's a, yeah, it's, it's all a flat, flat bottom. So it no really, steps. it really sticks to the water, you know? So mm-hmm. yeah, it'll be slower, but there's nothing like seeing that disease that, that are, turn. They, and it's not even that slow. I mean, it had those old L sixes and yeah. it went like what? 55. It's probably something like that. Probably fifties. It's definitely in the fifties. Yeah. I mean, for, for the boat, yeah, I'll they, take 55. They, that's the only, that's probably the biggest gripe that a CV gets from people is it's heavy and you don't get the best fuel economy. Mm-hmm. And they're not as fast as, you know, these in, Invincibles and all these other boats that are doing, se- you know, Freeman, right? you know, doing 70. Yeah. But at the same time, in what sea conditions can you go 70 all the time? Not as often. No. I mean, a lot of them will do a lot of, I mean, that's kind of. But I if know, you could get it, if you could get a CV to 70, they'll do 70 <laughs> in a lot of seas. Dude, you know what I mean? Most of the CVs will all do 60 now. I mean, they. They're, you're running 60, mm-hmm. which I, especially I think the CV is one that's going to benefit from the V10 the most. Yeah. Oh, de- most definitely. They, it's funny because you, we're actually, 
we've got a video about going from three engines to four where we took three engines off the back of the boat and we're putting four on there. Mm -hmm. And that, that video is actually going to come out on the main channel here pretty soon. But I think you hear a lot of people complain about that, that, Oh, what's with this trend of putting four, five, six, out all these outboards on the back of the boat. And I mean, for the most part, three to four engines are, are pretty much like the standard, you know, I get it. The five, the six, that's, that's midnight that's, express kind of thing. That's, that's getting, that's, you know, that's that's a whole different deal. That's not like a functional. That's just to show your class. Yeah, you know, yeah, that, like, I'm yeah. up here, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Those are the guys that you know are stripping off hundies as they're going along. Like, just yeah, you know, like, don't even care. It's like, oh, did you touch my boat? Oh, it doesn't matter. Here yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I heard a story one time about a guy taking a test run on like that, and you know, they they go on these test runs of these boat shows, and you can get like two or three different potential clients on the boat. Mm -hmm. And um, one guy was, one guy asked the captain, he's like, you know, how, what's the fuel economy on this boat? What's the, you know, what's, what do you, what's the average deal here? Yeah. And the guy, the other guy on the other side, like looks over at him. He's like, look, if you can't afford to do this and he takes out a wad of hundreds and he just starts peeling them off, just like just stripping <laughs> them off and let him fly out the back of the way. He's like, you can't do this. Then you shouldn't even be on this boat. And it's like, oh, oh my goodness. Oh. But that's like you said, that that's hurt. a whole different, that whole hurt. different class of like, that's not really functional. Mm. Whereas these triples and these quads, the, the whole deal is that these guys want to go 30, 40, 50, 60 miles offshore. And when you're doing 60 miles an hour in a center console that's built for fishing, that's not a, a big sport fish, which is a whole different style of boat and fishing. Mm hmm. It's, it's a center console that does 60. So now you're leaving the dock at 7 o'clock. You're already at your spot at like 8, 8.30. You can fish for three hours and then make it back by lunchtime. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like the whole process of it is that they want to be able to go out, go fishing, catch their fish, be back by noon, go out for lunch, go out hang out with the family. Like yeah. That's why they want They want the speed. But also in these boats, like, you know, the 59 Tirana and all these other, like Midnight Express. I mean, that's different. Ooh, or that, what was it, a 65 HCB with oh, yeah. six, yeah. six V12s? That's just... It's a, that's insane. But you get to that big of a boat, the sea conditions aren't as... Um, it won't affect it as it much. It doesn't affect it as much, no. Yeah, I mean, you, it'll eat. Yeah, they eat. So they are doing they are doing 50, 60 miles an hour in three, four footers. Mm -hmm. It's because those three, four insane. footers feel like little choppers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, people complaining about that. I mean, for me, I work on them. So it's, I like yeah, the toys, the the, you know, like, go, go for it. I mean, I like, I like playing with the stuff. So, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's all. Yeah. But as far as adding that fourth engine, I'm interested to see how that that did with like you know economy and and speed and all that. Yeah, we didn't get Is to it, play around with the propping. No, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. See, that happened a lot though. There was a lot of crunch time repowers where mm -hmm. you know, like for example, he needed it for a tournament, I think. Yep. And we didn't have time to mm -mm. mess around. He was with the, he was taking that boat like. <laughs> yeah, he was like, I don't care if there's no props on all of them, but one, <laughs> I need this boat. <laughs> Like, I was also. What, what did we put on there? Because he had three engines. I don't know what props. Well, that we had. We, they were all four different props that he picked up from somewhere. That's right. Um, yeah, he went and picked them up. But that, that was back in a time where you couldn't get, you couldn't get fuel filters. You couldn't get fuel filter brackets. You couldn't get fuel hose. You couldn't get all this different stuff. And it was like we're trying to put all this stuff together. Yeah, all that with COVID. like whatever you could get. That whole COVID and, was terrible. Yeah, it was. Not like not like the normal, you know, where you're normal, you would do something like that. You've got the time to do it, but also you've got anything you need. You know, mm -hmm. you need a prop, you need a fuel filter, you need a bracket, you need, you know, whatever. You just go to the store and get it, and then you finish the job the way it's supposed to be done, opposed to, like, putting something together. Yeah, because like, propping a boat is, like, a lot of trial and error. 
I mean, yeah. Unless it's something well, you that's get some numbers. Unless it's something that's well documented, like this boat with this engine combo mm-hmm. needs this. Yeah, you know at this mean? engine height, what all those. And yeah, I don't think that was a thing for us. I mean, Mm-mm. honestly, the center engines could have gone up a little bit, but that's just where that's where it was supposed to be mounted. That's where they mm-hmm. were. That's where it said to mount it, and then you know, once it's mounted and you're looking at it, it's like. Yeah, these can well, actually should go up. It should go up a little bit, but now you got to take them back off. You got to take off the forty two hundred. You got to, you know, and that just it's not worth that. Well, we we kind of uh, strayed away from the head gasket topic, didn't we? We strayed, yeah, pretty far. But hey, uh, that's the beauty of a podcast. Oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Because I mean, about whatever. I guess I guess when you start talking about CVs and yeah, you Stuff get a like little that. giddy. Yeah, brings out the kid in me. I'm like, <laughs> I just, just want to play on a CV. Dude, I, I'm a, but I guess, like you said, them CVs. The one bad thing is the fuel economy. I mean, we just that's had the only to put, thing people complain about. Yeah, if you had one bad thing to say about CVs, it's yeah. definitely fuel economy. They're heavy, um, but there's nothing else you're complaining about. I mean, no. If you want offshore center console fishing, mm-hmm. that's the boat. Yeah, I mean, we just had to put a bladder on a 37. Mm-hmm. CV because he would like just barely skim it back to the dock mm-hmm. when he'd go tuna fishing. Well, yeah, well, so a lot of those people too. At the same time, these guys are they're running to the Bahamas. They're running all over the place. Like they're you know. Well, when you got a CV, <laughs> yeah. you got a boat like that. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, you're gonna be doing that stuff. It's yeah, just, it's just what comes with it. They're know? not they're not going ten miles off doing yellow. You know exactly. You know what I mean? It's not. Unless it's a charter company, then, and I mm-hmm. guess you know they're going to be doing. Yeah, I don't know what. I, maybe maybe not because. Well, charter companies they'll just do whatever the client wants. You know, yeah. they'll run that boat as hard as you want to pay them to run it. <laughs> yeah, you know how far out does Jack go in that big old? All over, Tortugas, miles. wherever you want to go. That's right. Wherever you want to go. You, did you go on that trip to the Tortugas or? Not not with him. No. Yeah, the only yeah. times I've been out to Tortugas is um, with other other people. I've never been. It sounds it's actually pretty sweet. You know, I mean, you can do the ferry out there. That's that's really cool. Yeah, what all I've heard about the Tortugas is like, imagine the Keys 50 years ago. And mm-hmm. That's what the fishing is like. That's what the water is. It's like, it's untouched. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, well, it's 70, 70 miles off Key West. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a 70-mile run is... That's a haul. Yeah. So your your total trip, you're talking 140 miles. But, I mean, you go out there to the fort, I mean, the water, the clarity, like everything's, it's beautiful out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, massive coral heads. It's, it's really, really nice. Yeah, I bet. Something I definitely want to do someday. Mm-hmm. Crystal clear blue water. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's the Bahamas. Even fishing in the Bahamas, because I've never done that either. I've gone yeah. to the Bahamas plenty of times, just, yeah. you know, a cruise ship or whatever. I've been to Bimini a couple times, but mm-hmm. even that place is overran. Yeah. You know, I want to do one of those trips like like these people do. They take their boat and they, they go yep. to one of the more low-key Secluded. islands. Yeah. Yep. They, you know, they're out there. There's nothing but locals there, but, mm-hmm. you know, they've been going recurring so many times that, they know everybody. It's like family there, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're like, hey, look, this guy's here. He's about to strip off the bennies. <laughs> <laughs> well, treat him good. Treat him good. Yeah, hey, this guy over here, he's Mr. Tips, man. You he's got a go. plane over there. Man. <laughs> but I'd love to do one of those trips someday. Yeah. That sounds No, definitely. Awesome. I would. I definitely want to go adventure around the Bahamas a lot more mm-hmm. and check out a lot of those more secluded areas that haven't been overrun with tourists and, and everything else. Yeah. It's definitely... On the list. Should we should we start answering a couple questions yeah, let's here? Hit some, let's hit some topics yeah, that people want to know. Let's ask at least a couple. Yeah. Uh, first question, Shay or Shy, I don't know how to pronounce that exactly, but he said he's got a 225 Optimax, and he can't get it to pee on the flush attachment for the life of him. He said he's bought a nose cone, he's bought a uh, mm-hmm. muffs, everything, put the hose straight to it, won't yeah. pee. Replace the impeller and everything, but he says when it's submerged in the water, it pees fine. Sounds I like I think you might need to try another hose because <laughs> you ain't got pressure. Yeah, sounds like you don't have water pressure. But there's a lot of those two strokes that they don't um, 
I mean, yeah, actually, now that I think of it, I've, I've had a couple of those older ones. You put the, and it just doesn't pee. Mm -mm. I wonder why it's not getting past the impeller. Some, some engines don't. Some engines, you put them on the flush, and they, they just don't pee. So whether that's water pressure, the earmuffs you're using, um, could I mean, be multiple yeah, he factors. He sounds like he's gone through. He's thrown the book at it. And yeah. He's done the nose cone, the muffs. Put it straight to the engine. Yep, that's just one of those things that... The only thing I could tell you to try is getting more water pressure. More water if, pressure or, like, also, whatever. what are you trying to accomplish, too? So, like, you know, if he's just flushing it or trying to, like, diagnose something or do something like that, put it in a bucket. Just put it in a bucket. Sure, I think he means... Um, I'm pretty sure it was on that video... With that, flushing, that flushing your outboard. Maybe, I can't remember now what video he commented that on, but uh, I think it's probably just like, you know, as far as after you come back, yeah, you know, flushing the engine just like one does. Put it like in a bucket. supposed to do, mm -hmm. I think. Oh, yeah. You know, prevent yourself from building up all that corrosion, blowing a head gasket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Flush your engine, use salt away, mm -hmm. all the good stuff. Yep. Now, put it in a bucket. Take, yeah. a, take a bucket, put it under the engine, trim the engine down into the bucket. Yeah, if you really Stick want to see a pee, there. if that'll make you sleep better at night and you can't get it to do it on the hose. Well, otherwise, don't run it. I mean, if, if you can't get it to pee, don't run. I wouldn't run the engine too long without it peeing just because. Right, but you're running I mean, you don't risk. necessarily have to run the engine when flushing it. No, yeah. no. You can hook up right to the flush attachment on the back. I know it's kind of a pain with those Optimaxes because... Um, oh yeah, it's in the it's in the back, the back, and you screw the hose into yep. it, and it's, and it's in a rubber thing, and the rubber thing can pop in the cowling, and that can be its own problem. And then, as it gets older, the black, everything you touch on there turns black. <laughs> it's like really dirty to mess mm -hmm. with. And well, do you think that could be it? Maybe it's the thing popped off, and it's just not. No, because he's talking oh, about putting said, on earmuffs. He said muffs and all that. Yeah. yeah, no. Yeah. So no, it's not. It's not that. I would. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's dude, there's tons of people that just bucket it. I mean, you get a get a 32 or 48 or whatever trash can, mm -hmm. stick it underneath the lower unit, stick your hose in there, turn the hose on. Once it fills up, what if he leaves the boat on the water? Hmm. I mean, they make bags. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> no, they do. They do. There are bags that like you. Like strap them around the front or over the top of the cowling, and it holds this bag underneath the engine, well, and then you can fill the bag up with water. If you get desperate, but I'll see why not. Um. Anyway, on to the next one. Our boy Wayne, he says that his engine he's got a he's got a ninety six one fifteen Evinrude, and the trim works fine otherwise. But when he goes in reverse, and I assume gives it some mm -hmm. some goose, it it kicks back like it jumps up. Mm -hmm. Now, anything with that Showa um, trim unit, they super common for those older ones. A lot of times, there's not really anything that you can do about it. You can take the whole trim unit apart, and there's springs and check valves and stuff in there mm -hmm. that can get worn. The springs wear out, and it's just um, even when it's completely full of fluid. And there's like no visible issues with it. It's just a leak by within the internal orifices of yeah. that trim unit that is letting fluid pass by the different chambers and valves mm -hmm. that are inside of that trim unit. So um, it's common and there's nothing really that you can do to fix it outside of taking the whole trim unit off disassembling it, cleaning everything, trying to figure out if you've got like, you know, it may, there's a bad spring in there that you can change out. But other than that, see, but I don't know some of those trim units, I'm not too familiar with, you know, what exactly it was on an Evan room, but like I, I took apart trim units for Yamaha mm -hmm. when I went to that class and well, a lot of those are the same ones. It's a Showa. Okay. But you got to kind of know what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's yeah. really easy to mess it up when you, if you when don't you put, yeah, if you don't back, pay attention to it when you're taking yeah, it apart, yeah, because there are to, little balls and valves, and you have they to can put everything back exactly how mm -hmm. it came apart. Because yep. if not, it'll you can mess it up. Yeah, it'll you'll mess something else up altogether, and 
then it's even, I mean, now you just got to buy a new unit mm-hmm. altogether. But what would be, I mean, unless he wants to do it himself, mm-hmm. what would be the better option? Buy a whole new unit or have somebody? You can find those units for, now, for pretty cheap. Yeah, now, nowadays, I mean, I haven't dealt with anything like that for a while because um, now you're buying, you know, if you go to buy a used one, you're buying a 20 20 year old trim unit unless you try and buy a new one um from like i don't know if you can buy a new one from evanrude i'm not sure i mean evanrude's technically not dead no but um but i don't know there there's a lot of parts that they ain't making yeah i haven't done a lot of research into so the whole evanrude side of things either if you can find one, you know, replacing it might be the same as the cost of trying to fix it. Otherwise, kind of not really much you can, unless you've got like a leak and mm-hmm. it's and it's low on fluid. Um, but a lot of times it's the springs and the valves that are inside of there that they're just getting worn. And there's not much you can do about there's it. There's not much you can do about it. Other than. You know, take it apart. It's going to be a hassle anyway. Yeah, no matter what, it's going to be a hassle. No matter what, you're going to have to take the unit apart. You can try and fill it up, but it's been my experience that it's not. They don't do that because they're low on fluid. They mm-hmm. do that because the internal passages of that one chamber, I can't remember if it's the main chamber or whatever it is, mm-hmm. internally is allowing the force of the of the engine going backwards is enough to pull that piston up okay. and let the fluid just yeah. pass by and it just mm-hmm. the trim unit can't because normally um it's the actual hydraulic you know structure and the passages and the val- valves and all that inside the unit that keeps it from kicking up but hope hope you get that figured out uh now we got johnny ringo he says that he's got a 115 merc two stroke um, and he it, it chatters when decelerating. Not, I don't think it specifically says prop chatter or any kind. It just it chatters when decelerating. What what do you think that is? Because I know I know you said something about Mercury's. There are some lower units that that will do that because of the way the you know the boat's still going. Mm-hmm. So you've got the weight of the water coming off the bottom of the boat. And then hitting that prop, which continues the prop to spin, even though you're in neutral. So you hear the gears. Yeah, because there. aren't there some of them that that when you when you spin the prop backwards, it like one, clicks. Yeah, I've definitely heard that. Like it'll yeah. ring, you yep. know, and it's yep. So yeah, I guess the way the water's running across the prop, since yep. it's technically reverse process, it's just spinning yeah. the other way. Yep. Yep. Huh. And it's kind of like that the gears in there are like designed basically to let that roll over. Right. Um, Do you know if it was that case on, on a old Merc two stroke one fifteen? I not, I can't give you a hundred percent that, 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 that engine has that lower unit that does that, but mm-hmm. that's very common on a lot of those where like, like you said, you hear that, that yeah. click yeah, whenever yeah. you spin it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what's doing it. It's the weight of the water. Coming off the bottom of the boat. Is there any other thing that could be causing a chatter? Because if not, then that sounds like by default he's probably got one of those lower units. Yeah. Other than that, you've got some potentially catastrophic issues. Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe piston slapping around, but you'd hear that most likely all the time. Clutch dog and the forward reverse gears. Yeah. Your pinion. But, yeah, so I guess pay attention to, like, take it out, maybe try spinning the prop, you yeah. know, in the opposite direction, out of mm-hmm. the water while it's in neutral off, mm-hmm. and see. Change the gear loop and see what it looks like. It's you muddy. Can get, you can get, you know, quart of gear loop for 15 bucks or whatever. Mm-hmm. Get you a little pumper, two drain seals, and for 30 bucks... Yeah, but then what if you got water in your lower unit? I, I mean, it's better to to do that and find out if you got a bunch of water. Like if you pull that drain plug and you got water and metal and gray and junk coming out of there, it's better that you found that out now rather than yeah, ten miles away from land. 
Yep. When all of a sudden you can't go mm-hmm. anywhere. <laughs> mm hmm. What's the next one? So, Cameron, um, he asks, well, actually, this is a question with a sound system. So, he said he went expensive on everything um, with the amp and the speakers. I think it's a fusion system, 150 watt speakers. Um, he said he cheaped out on the receiver, I guess, spent like 50 bucks on it. Um, but he's asking if he's going to need to change that receiver to get the full output from the subs and speakers. No. In theory, you know, I'm pretty sure the way it works is well, if, you, if you got an amp, right, that handles enough power to, or that outputs enough to, to handle all the speakers in the sub, then really it doesn't matter what your head unit's putting out because that only affects the speakers that are directly hooked right. to the head unit. Yep. You know what I mean? So really, I guess that one's just that simple. Yeah. If you've got an amp that's rated for the numbers that you want to reach, you know, like all the numbers added up for all your speakers and mm-hmm. your sub, you know, maybe if you want to bridge your sub, yep. then get an amp that's properly sized for that. But I don't know. You say you went expensive with a Fusion amp, then you'll probably be all right powering all those speakers in the sub, but your head unit or your receiver shouldn't have, shouldn't affect it all that much. No, because at all. all your receiver is doing is giving that signal to the amp, and then the amp is what supplies your power yeah. to the speakers. Mm-hmm. So whatever your speakers are rated for, as long as your amp matches, you know, as long as you've got that right, then as long as your amp's right for your, you're not re- you're not putting out any power from the head unit to the amp. It's mainly just a signal. Like yeah. it's, you know, it's giving that audio to the amp and then the amp is doing all the work. Mm-hmm. So unless, like you said, you're using. Yeah. Unless you've got a speaker hooked directly to the head unit, the head unit. Yeah. It's not going to. Nope. Your head unit's not going to nope. matter. And we've actually got a, um, we've got a video about stereos that we put out. We can actually, what we should probably do is link some of these videos in, in there. So we'll link to that video of that stereo. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if you got any more questions, then. We are, yeah, go ahead. Well, all right, moving on. We got John asks, how hard is it to switch from mechanical controls to uh, DTC or what a Suzuki equivalent for a 2019 200 Suzuki? Mm. That might be impossible. Yeah. Um, the only really, really the only way, I mean... Yeah, it's not really unless you use some kind of aftermarket digital control with control cables and these digital this digital shifting, mm-hmm. you have to have a digital engine. Right. To have DTS or fly by wire or electronic throttle control or you know whatever DEC, each brand has their own specific type of you know brand yeah tagging of it. But no, you've got to have a digital engine to have digital throttle and shift i I don't think there's i don't think there's a way to do it unless the engine comes you know ready for it like yeah i mean i couldn't tell you on a 200 suzuki exactly because i've you know i haven't had the cowling off too many of those and haven't really done many repowers with those either so i don't know you know everything that goes into their Mm -hmm. dec system but i don't think i know of any engines that like even I don't know. How do you think they do it? Do you think they do it like the V8s? Like there's V8, V6s for Mercury that it's mechanical, but it's digitally mechanical. You know what yeah. I mean? It's so like, like you've got a mechanical box that's shifting something on the engine that, that just tells the shift actuator to shift the engine. So mm-hmm. it's still electronically shifting just with a mechanical. Yeah, it's still basically a digital engine mm-hmm. with mechanical. So like... Basically, what you're what he's talking about is having like I think based on the question I think what he's talking about having is like if I go out and buy you know this mechanically controlled engine that has mm-hmm. a mechanical shift mechanism and a mechanical throttle valve mechanism that mm-hmm. controls the opening and closing of the throttle valve that requires an actual cable to do that in order to make that digital there isn't really 
anything that I know of where you can purchase the equipment to put on an electronic throttle valve and an electronic shift actuator Mm -hmm. that then attaches to, you know, your shift rod and then moves it based on what the computer tells it to do. So like, if that's what we're talking about, then not really, I, I don't, you can't, you have to have a digital engine to begin with. But like the way Mercury's new, those V6 V8s, they do come in mechanical because the way the engine is designed is that the computer on the engine, the throttle body and the lower unit shifting is all still digitally controlled. So on a DTS engine, it's all computerized. The mm-hmm. com- the computer tells the shift actuator to shift, which mm-hmm. then shifts the lower unit. It tells the electronic throttle body to open or close the throttle valve. Mm-hmm. On the mechanical engines, there's these little sensors, they call them demand sensors, mm-hmm. on the side of the engine. And those sensors have a knob on them that hooks to a control cable. So when you move the control cable, it moves that demand sensor and then that sensor then tells the computer to control the throttle body or the shift actuator. So it's still basically a digital engine mm-hmm. receiving a digital signal from that demand sensor, but like from a mechanical aspect, if you take a mechanical engine that's mechanically controlled, you can't there's not really a you know yeah. But yeah. in that case, like in the Mercury's case, like you're saying, it's got those demand sensors. Mm-hmm. Could you just yank out those throttle and shift cables, hook up a DTC control box, and it's already equipped technically to um, do that all digitally? Or does it need to see those demand sensors moving now? I think it Is need, that like in the computer's yes, program? Yes, I think it's in the computer's programming to where you'd have to change out the PCM. Mm-hmm. I think. I think you'd have to change out the PCM right. because the PCM... That makes sense because that PCM in particular is waiting for this signal from exactly. the demand sensor. Yeah, it's not looking for a di- direct command from yeah. your control box, but... But technically... I mean, technically you should... That yeah. control box is now... The demand demand sensor. sensor. Right. It's got those potentiometers or whatever. And that's technically now, it's doing the same function as those. Yeah. I mean, potentiometers. You would think it would work like that, but I'm not. It's just something I guess you'd have to try. You'd have to try. I've never never tried to do it. Never tried it. There's never been a reason to try it. Um, I'm sure someone's asked the question. I mean, I'm pretty sure that I was told no. I I want to say. Are mechanical engines or mechanically digital engines cheaper than a DTC engine? Yes. That might be why someone's asking. Yes, and and I want to say that you can't because, I mean, now maybe it might be a little different, but I want to say a few years ago we had a set of like, um, you know, mechanically controlled, um, I think there were 300s or 250s or something like that, mm-hmm. and someone wanted that. So we called Mercury and we're like, hey, you know, I got these CMS mechanically controlled 300s or whatever, and somebody wants to buy them, put them on a DTS boat, can they do that? And I'm pretty sure they said that we couldn't. And it was based on that, just whatever it was, the programming, the mapping, the physical right. aspects. I don't know. I mean, right. I guess. So for Mercury, I guess we know, but Suzuki's not too familiar. I, I don't know how it works with the 2019 200 Suzuki. I mean, it's the same technology. You're, you think it's just those potentiometers or those demand sensors? They don't have demand. I don't, I don't think Suzuki mechanical Suzuki doesn't have those demand sensors. So it's a, a Suzuki mechanical yeah. is true mechanical. It's not. I'm pretty sure unless something's changed, all the all the ones I've ever seen, like a mechanical Suzuki is a straight up mechanical. Okay. Now, like the like the the new ones, like with the digital throttle and stuff, like it, it's pretty sweet. So, like you know your your port or starboard, it'll go either way with just the flip of a of a wire. Mm-hmm. So like it, they've got some pretty cool aspects, but. I'm pretty sure if you buy one of the mechanical engines, there's not really, a, I don't think there's a conversion kit for it. I may be wrong, but there's not one that I know of. Mm-hmm. So, unfortunately, no. Can't. <laughs> so, well, I guess to answer the question, it's very hard, mm-hmm. uh, technically impossible. Yep. 
game's always changing though. So mm-hmm. there's always new products. There's always new things. So yeah, maybe, maybe somebody's thought of that problem and went out and actually put in the work and yeah. And I've never something. seen those aftermarket cause there is aftermarket DTS yes. that just hooks up to a, mm-hmm. so that what, how does that work? It just feels aftermarket on the control side and then it's just, no, there's like, of, there's like computers I mean, it and feels stuff. Uh, electronic on the yeah on the control box um i'm trying to think there was a there was a pursuit that that you messed with wasn't there it had the three threes i think it was a grady was it a grady Mm -hmm. i remember there's there's quite a few that i've seen that like there's but um, i but i don't think i i think morse makes one i I think c star makes one those control boxes because another tech ended up oh yeah working on that boat yeah 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 because they're like it's like digital, but then it goes to these boxes in the back that have these cables that mm-hmm. then the control cables physically connect to the engine, but they mechanic, you know, they're digitally controlled. It's like, yeah, I guess if he wants to go with something like that, I don't know what, what it costs or. I don't think the, I don't think the cost is worth it. Yeah. No, no. I mean, a, a properly installed set of control cables with control box with grease and everything, I mean they're they're pretty. You Feels, can get them. You can get them pretty buttery. Yeah, but there's, I don't know. It, obviously, it's, it's mechanical. Yeah, yeah. It's obviously you, you mechanical. Know it's mechanical. I mean, you know I've never it's felt anything that, that feels quite as smooth, quite as good as that. There's not. You can't. I mean, you can't go from digital to mechanical and and cross them. But you can make mechanical feel pretty nice as long as you know how to shift it. I mean, you shift it hard. Mm-hmm. You don't, you know, you don't do the old do, 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 and then wait for the gears to grind before you finally get into gear. Yeah. You, you know, boom. Yeah. Stick it in gear. Yep. Be assertive. You know, be assertive. Put, put it, you're put it in detail. Gear. Yeah. You're going in gear. No second do guess it. it. It's not like, am I going in gear? Am I? Oh, no. 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 Send it. Bam. Right. Yeah. Yep. There you go. There you go. Well, anyway, our boy Theon here, he's got an interesting question. He asks our opinion on Seven Marine. Mm, seven Marine. Yeah. See, personally, I am a giant fan of Seven Marine. I also don't know a whole lot about their story. I don't know how they came up. I don't know why Volvo Penna discontinued them. I don't, did they have problems? I love them because I like Chevy and their LSs and, <laughs> and and they're freaking cool. I mean, simple as that for me. But do you know anything about? I don't know a whole lot about them. I know that just like you know, I mean, when they came out, it was a hundred thousand dollar outboard, so you know they weren't Ooh, like. I yeah, they were expensive. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure it's a hundred thousand, but it it was. Well, I mean, look, it was super 600, expensive. Six hundred twenty-seven horse. Yeah. Whereas now. A V12 making 600 is how much? Almost 100,000, right? It's close to it, yeah. Close to I mean... I want to say 600, you can get them like 80, something like that. That's not maybe, bad. Maybe 75? I'm not 100. That's not bad. You spent 100,000, $80,000. For, for a V12? $80,000. Where are you going to buy a V12 for Do any less than... Do you have $80,000 sitting around? No. <laughs> but I'm putting myself in the shoes of the rich man. I'm going to be like, man, that's a bargain. <laughs> Like, I was thinking about buying an event, a Lamborghini Aventador and getting a V12, yeah. but you're telling me I could spend like nine hundred thousand dollars less and just put it on a boat? Well, yeah. now you gotta, now you gotta buy the boat. <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting back into the yeah <laughs> into the normal V12 price points. Yep. Oh, uh, man. but for what it is, I think it's pretty reasonable. Pretty reasonable. No, I didn't. Especially spending a hundred grand on a. V8 sitting horizontally yeah. in an outboard. It's insane. No, they, they, I never really got to play around with them. I know mm-hmm. someone about them. I've got a, a few buddies of mine that work for Volvo dealerships. And so they went to, you know, was, when Volvo bought seven, they went to a lot of the training and dealerships and stuff like that. And so, you know, I know based on talking to him, um, somewhat about them, but not, I don't know a whole lot about them. And then, you know, once Volvo bought them, it wasn't a few years later that they, they shut the whole pro- project down. So hmm. why they shut it down, I don't know. I mean, I know I did read somewhere that Volvo put out some kind of like press release or something so, talking about, you know, moving towards electric and inboards and, and all this other stuff. So, 
I mean, did did that play a factor in it, or is there something behind the scenes that I don't that we don't know about? Probably, but um, hmm. I think I think I remember seeing something about them talking about focusing on electric and and really going in, you know, putting more effort into that. So, yeah. and it might have been an expensive project to run. I mean, again, you're talking the high end, like that is a high end market. Yeah, it's a very niche yeah. buyer who's yeah. going to get one of those. Yeah, you're talking about the the ten. Five, maybe probably the one percent. I mean, I don't know about the one percent. Maybe at least the top ten, five percent of boating, like boaters, mm-hmm. you know, are in the market for a six-figure outboard. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how they did. Were they fuel efficient? Or were they? I don't, I don't, I don't know. think they were that fuel they efficient. They must have not been. I mean, come on, dude. They must have not been good for anything other than <laughs> being freaking cool. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, they. I guess, how long did they make it? A couple of years, a few years? Quite a few years. I mean, maybe almost 10. I don't know. That's not, that's not terrible. I don't know if it's actually... Gotta be a few of them lying around. 10 years, but... See, I want to know. I want to know if you could buy one, like a used one. Rip it out. Founded in 2010, so 12 years, 13 years. They had like a 12-year run. Okay, not bad. It's an LS. Yeah. It's the same engine as in your truck. That's so that's so weird to me. You just take that and boom. Mm-hmm. Sideway or horizontal. It's some of the Hondas though. It's just not same thing. I think that Honda isn't isn't that um the Civic or isn't there one of their cars that uses basically almost the same engine? It's just vertical and upside down. Not sure. I'm not too sure with Honda. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know a whole lot about about Hondas, unfortunately, because you don't see them down here. Yeah, yeah, they're just they're not a saltwater mm-hmm. engine. If we're being and honest, if you if you keep super up popular with it. up north in Washington, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm pretty sure in Washington they're like they're a hot dog up there. Mm-hmm. Well, we are. Starting to run out of time here, but yeah, got one last question to answer. Probably the most important one yet. Our boy, oh yeah, our boy T Cone. He asks, "Do you golf?" Oh, um, you probably saw the hat, the T yeah. wood hat with the little pin and the. Mm-hmm. I don't ever use that pin because I can't land on the green. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, man, Donnie, you you hit some bombs. Hey. He can. <sighs> no, let's be real. You hit the bombs. I am a little better around the green than you yeah. are. I've got the finesse. Yeah. But you hit like some um, some Mac Daddy like missile drives. <laughs> <laughs> Not always good, but impressive. And I'd rather, in my opinion, I'd rather have an impressive drive that people are like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, like, okay. Even if it doesn't land anywhere playable, I'm like, yeah, I just hit that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that consistent with them, but... Um, yeah, we definitely like to go play for sure. Yeah, definitely like to go play. Yep. Um, Especially more now that we're in Sebastian, because mm-hmm. I mean, in the Keys you had Key Colony, which was yep. I like Key Colony. I love Key Colony. It's, it's a nice nine hole par three. Yep. I only had to carry four clubs. Yep. It's I mean, it's great. And then you work on the short game. You know, that's, yep. that's what they say: drive for show, putt for dough. Mm-hmm. But that kind of ruined playing like big courses for me because yeah. I could work around the green, but I couldn't get to the green very efficiently. <laughs> you know what I mean, I had no idea how to swing a driver. It's a whole different, whole different thing. So I've been hitting the range. I've been, I've been practicing it up, getting some, getting some bombs going, but yeah, I need to work on my short game for sure. Now that we've been up here, I mean, when we were down there playing key Colony, like I did shoot, the best I she ever shot there was at a 29 in Key Colony, which is par three. But up here, my short game's kind of gone to. Gone uh, down I ain't trying to call you out, but you definitely got to work. On, <laughs> <laughs> you definitely got to work on the putting, dude. At least the putting. Yeah, yeah, my putting and, and my chipping. I mean, my chipping's yeah. not been so hot lately either. Six but degrees been betraying me. My bunker no. shots are good. You've been betraying the 60 degree. Probably. I love the 60 degree. I never slander that that <laughs> club. It's that's actually my favorite club. But yeah, to answer the question, yeah, we do like to go play. Um, 
a lot of times we like to go play uh, before we record our podcast, actually, because we try and go out there and just kind of come up with ideas, brainstorm, mm -hmm. and, you know, think about content to bring you guys what's interesting, what our topics are, and um, kind of review everything. So, yeah, we definitely like to go play. and Yeah. Hopefully I will be better than Tiger Woods someday. <laughs> yeah. <be> <laughs> Uh, yeah, never going to happen. Anyway, <laughs> that's about it for time. Yeah. Uh, leave some comments or ask questions at our email, askbab at bornagainboating.com. But we're going to be looking forward to answering as many as we can. Mm -hmm. So see you guys on the next one. Catch you next week.